John chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 26 here this morning. Just a few verses, but they are power-packed. Now, in the passage we're going to study this morning, Jesus here does something that seems a little bit strange. Until you look a little deeper into what he says. Because some men come seeking to see him, and he doesn't really seem to answer the specific question that they have, and to respond to them appropriately. But what he does do in responding to them is what they really need to know, and what will bring them to the desired end that he wants to bring them to. They want to see him in a very physical sense, but Jesus wants them to see him in a very different way, to see him in a spiritual sense. So let's just read this and we'll get into it. Verse 20 says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, We wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, in this response that Jesus gives here, it just seems a little different. Because these guys have come here to look and to see him, to have an encounter with Jesus, to talk with him. And yet Jesus here is addressing, I think, the deeper and the more important issue. And that is that they need to see him in a different way. Now Jesus took situations like this and he just turns them around, turns them upside down sometimes. He did this many times in his ministry. When you look at how he dealt with the woman at the well. Remember, there was the discussion was about a drink of physical water. And Jesus turned it around and he said, no, you need a drink of spiritual water, living water, that will satisfy the depths of your soul. And so many times Jesus would do this. He would just take the situation and he'd turn it around from a physical situation to a spiritual situation, which I think he is very, very good at. And so why does Jesus do this with this question? They come seeking to see him, and then he turns around and seemingly doesn't really even say anything that is really in harmony with what they're doing. He says to them, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, what Jesus is doing here is simply getting to the real issue. The issue that he knows they need to understand. And that is, if they want to truly see who he is, where are they going to be able to really comprehend who he is? Well, it's going to be at the cross. And after the cross, the resurrection. That's what's going to reveal who he is. That's what's going to enable them to see him the way they need to see him. Now, this term here, the hour has come. It's a term that Jesus has used throughout his ministry. We've made notice of this several times in our study of the Gospel of John. At the very beginning when in chapter 2 where his mother comes to him and he says, my hour is not yet come. And in chapter 7 he says the same thing, my hour is not 
yet come. But now he declares here, my, uh, the hour has come. And what is about to take place? In a couple of days, he's going to be crucified for the sins of the world. And so this particular terminology here is very clear. It is a terminology that continually refers to the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Now, why does Jesus do this? Because he doesn't want people to just know facts about him or to have some physical relationship with him. He wants them to have a spiritual relationship with him. You see, there are many times people know about Jesus, but they, they know facts about him, but they don't personally know him. And there is a big difference. People come to church sometimes all their lifetime. I've met them. It's, it's incredible. And they, then they tell me, well, I came to this point and I realized I really did not know Christ personally in my own life. I, I believed that he was a real person. I believed that he existed. But I didn't really believe him for the forgiveness of my own sin. And you, you think, how could somebody sit in church all their life and not get that? Well, I would lay blame upon the pastor of that church simply because if he is proclaiming the gospel and bringing this point up, because it's a point that Jesus brings up over and over again. It's not just a physical relationship, just not knowing facts. It's you've got to know him. You've got to have a real personal relationship with him. Now, Paul addressed this subject when he dealt with the Corinthian church. And the Corinthians, well, they were individuals that were very caught up in outward appearance and in, you know, just a show. And so what Paul does is he says, you know, this is not what you need to be concerned about. Don't be focused on the external. Be focused on the spiritual. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 and 17, he says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh or in the physical. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So notice, Paul said, we don't know just this guy, Jesus, who walked with us and taught us we know him in a completely different way today because he lives inside us, you see. And then he goes on and he says, therefore, if anyone is his in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so when you come into Christ, you become a new creation. And yet when you talk with people that knew you before you came to Christ? What do they usually want to talk about? They want to talk about what you used to be like according to the flesh, you see. And they're always bringing up those, those stories, those times. And I remember a guy one time came into our ministry uh, you know, that knew me as, as a non-Christian. And he says, I, I know the dirt on this guy talking about me. And he goes, and I just thought to myself, oh my goodness, don't, don't tell any of those stories, please. And then I thought to myself, no, you know what? That's the way I was before Christ. Who I am today is a totally different person. I am a new creation in Christ, and so are you. And so I just said, you know what? That's not the person I, I, what? I, I am now. I used to be that person but I am not that person anymore. And that's what you need to say when people want to talk about those, the old days. And so Jesus wanted these men seeking him to know him in a new way, in a way that they, they had not yet known. And he says, the only way you're going to really know me for who I am is you've got you to look at the cross. See me at the cross. See my death for you, my resurrection, then you're going to understand who I really 
am. Now this is why Jesus said in John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. He said, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? What things did they do? Well, they, he, was, he had cleansed the temple, driven the money changers out of the temple. And after he did this, they're saying, hey, what sign are you going to show us? Do some miracle to prove that you have the authority to do this. And how does Jesus respond? He said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You see, the reality of where somebody is going to find and see Jesus and see what authority he has, the proof of who he is, it's going to be in his death, in his resurrection. That's where it's going to be seen. And so a person has to truly see that, that truth before they will ever really know him and see him as he is. And so Jesus here is speaking about his death. In verse 24, he goes on and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, this is a simple analogy that he draws. It's a, it's a paradoxical analogy. Basically, that how can someone experience life through death? How does that take place? How does that work? And so Jesus just uses a simple seed, a single seed dropped into the ground and planted. It, that's the picture of death, into the ground. And then all of a sudden, it breaks forth into new life and that seed breaks open and out comes a little shoot, a little grain of wheat. And then how many seeds are on that one stalk of wheat? Multitudes. I mean, it's true with anything that you plant in the ground. You know, one seed from a tomato planted in the ground produces a multitude of tomatoes that all have a multitude of seeds within them. And so this is the analogy that Jesus is drawing. It's a simple analogy. Out of death comes life. So you're not going to truly see me until you see my death and my resurrection. That's what's going to produce the fruit. That's what's going to produce that change inside of you. Now, that is why we are sitting here today. Because we're the, the seeds that have been produced from the death of Christ. We are the seeds that have been produced from the death and the, the dying to self of someone who shared the gospel with us and their transformed life. You see, we're all the result of that death. Now think about this for a minute. Because the multitudes, the millions upon millions of people that have been come to Christ before you throughout history. Think of all those people. And then the multitudes and the millions of people that are going to come to Christ after you. And hopefully, you will be an individual who shares your faith and will bring someone to know him as well. But to do that, you have to die, you see. You have to die to self and die to fear and die to your pride and die to all those things that hinder you, that keep you back from sharing that your faith. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, there John said, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So here John sees this scene in heaven. And he sees this multitude which no man can number. And you, one person, 
will be standing in that multitude that no one can number. And we will be worshiping with, with all of them. And as you read the, the text there, they fall down and face first, worshiping him. All will all worshiping the king. And so the cross is the place that you can see Jesus. See him for, he, for who he really is. To see the love that he truly has for you. You see, that love that he has was willing to die to obtain you. Think about that. I mean, it's, it's a love that is beyond comprehension. A love that, look at the extent to which God would go to get you. That's, that's pretty incredible. That's how much he loves you. It shows how much he hates sin as well. Because he must, he must be just. And he must be holy. And so he must punish sin. And yet he decides and determines that he's not going to punish and he doesn't want to punish you for your sin. He will punish his own son for your sin. And if you will believe that, you will experience new life inside of you. It's an incredible principle. So how can you see Jesus? Well, you see Jesus by him first dying and rising again. But that's not all. That's clearly indicated in verses 23 and 24. But 25 and 26 goes on to talk about your death and what real discipleship means. What it means to follow him. And so he lays it out here in these two verses that are so powerful. Very similar to other places where, where Jesus has, has spoken these very same words. But he says it here. He says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Such a simple message. So what does he mean here? He means here that you have to die. Jesus means that to love your life versus hating your life in this world is the, is the decision, is the difficulty that we all battle with. It's the difference between real discipleship, and just a superficial Christian life. I have to die to self. I have to die to my own love of my own life if I'm going to truly be his disciple. He describes it here by this simple term here, he who hates his life in this world. Now, when people read this many times, as I did, I remember the first couple of years of my Christian life, I would read past this and, and I would say to myself, hate my life in this world. I don't know. I, uh, how do you do that? I, I like my life in this world. I, I like what's going on. I, and, you know, you think to yourself, well, I, you know, I, I love my wife. I, I love my, ki- my children. I love my grandchildren. I, uh, I like to go surfing. I, I, I like to go camping. I like to ski. I, there's so many things I like about my life. And, but that doesn't have anything to do with what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying you have to hate your life in this world. So what does that mean? What does it mean to hate your life in this world? Well, think about how the scripture defines the love of this world. You see, the opposite of hating your life in this world. So just look at the opposite of that. What does it mean to love this world? Well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 gives you the definition for this, what it means to love the world. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So what are those three things? The lust of the flesh, the lust, the desire for pleasure, the lust of the eyes, the lust, the desire for what you see. I want that. 
covetousness. That's what it's describing. The pride of life. It's the lust for position in life. The pride of a position or to be acknowledged or to have control over somebody else. You see, all of these are the things that God says, this is what you are not to love. In fact, that is what you should hate. You should hate these things because they destroy. Notice in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he defines a little bit further for us what this, this hatred of this world is. He says, For by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There it is. So what am I to hate in this world? It's the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice, so Peter connects 1 John 2, 15 and 16 together, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. He connects that with the corruption that is in this world. So is there anything in this world that is corrupting people and destroying people? That's what you need to hate. Now, you don't have to look far to think about the things and see the things that you should hate. You know, just this past week, uh, one of the brothers here, he takes a magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs. And he handed it to me, and I, I took it home. And when I picked it up, I looked at the picture on the front of it, and I just said to myself, I hate this. I hate this. So I'd like to just show you that picture, if you could just put that up. This is of a little girl in Nigeria who's had her arm taken off because of the persecution going on in Nigeria by Boko Haram. I looked at that picture and I just said, I hate this world. I hate what this world does to destroy people. And when you look at that and you just you look at the sadness in her eyes, you just you just say, This should not be taking place in this world. And Lord, I want you to come quickly and stop this mess. You know, when most of you saw the, the picture of <clears throat> a few months ago of one of the Syrian refugee families that they were coming out of the genocide there in Syria. And the little boy, little three-year-old boy had drowned. And he was laying face down in the sand on the beach. And you, you, you see this on the news. And when it came on the news, I just said, I hate this place. Lord, I hate what is going on in this world. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. But you don't have to go to the other side of the world to find things to hate, you see, about this, this life and about this world. You know, probably every single one of you in this room has a friend, a family member, somebody whose life has been destroyed by drugs or alcohol. And when I see that, I, I just, I shake my head and I just say, I hate this world. I hate what is going on in this world because this person's life is destroyed. Yes, they can recover themselves because of the power and the life that's in Christ. But I want this to stop. I don't, I don't like what I see going on in our world. You know, I look at the, the fact of, you know, that we have to defend ourselves against a, a totalitarian genocidal death cult in radical Islam. I, I hate the fact that we have to defend ourselves because if we don't, we will become subjugated to them. Guaranteed. And that's what they want to do. But I hate what it costs us. You know, you see veterans come back without their limbs. You see veterans come back with PTSD. You see 
the incredible suicide rate of veterans. It's incredible. 22 a day, every day, sometimes more. It's just incredible. I hate this world, and I hate what I see going on. You know, you, you just, you don't have to, you don't have to think long or hard about things that you should hate in this life. And it's why you should pursue the Lord all the more. Because you are the light of this world. And you are the one that has the answers to the death and the corruption that's in this world. You and you alone. It's not a political answer. It's not a social answer. It's a spiritual answer. That's what changes the political landscape, the social landscape, and all the rest of the problems in this life. Jesus will show that very clearly in one day when he returns. He's going to turn this world back to the Garden of Eden. And he, amen, I'm looking forward to that. I know. And he will show what this world should be like. That's what we need to fi fix our attention on and fix our eyes on today. And so if you want to see Jesus in your own life, then you have to hate your life in this world, which means to die to this world. That's what Paul declared when he described his own life. He said, the world is dead to me. All that seeks to corrupt me, he said, I don't want any part of it. I don't want to touch it. It will destroy me. And so all I can say to you is if you are really attracted by the world, if you're attracted by what's in the world, then you truly haven't died to the world. And until you, you really, it, this hatred for what corrupts and destroys in this world, until that is really formed inside of you, you really have not gone deep into your, your following Christ and, de and, and becoming his disciple. The second thing that I think Jesus here refers to is our hating your life. Now, notice, go back to verse 25. He said, he who hates his life, and then he says, we'll lose it. And he who hates his life in this world. So there's, there's two very clear items there that he says you need to hate. Hate your life in this world and hate your life. Now, what was the statement that Jesus made to his disciples when he clearly identified what real discipleship is all about? It's Matthew 16, 24. He says there, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. There is the death to self, the hatred of self. And then he says, take up his cross. There's the death part. You see, to take up your cross means you've got to die to you, die to self. And he said, and follow me. Now, notice in verse 26, Jesus is going to go on to the subject of following him. So, Matthew 16, 24 really encapsulates this part of this text very, very well. So, what does he want you to deny? He wants you to deny self. And what is the problem in this world today? Self. It's selfishness. It is that self-life. Self-will, self-seeking, self-pleasure, self-righteousness, self-exaltation. Everything that has to do with self, you see, it's, this needs to die. And if it doesn't, then I guarantee you, you cannot know his life. You can't see him and the, re the fruit and the result of what he wants to do in, inside of you. It's not going to happen. Because as long as you reign on the throne of your life, it's, it's going to be all about you. And when it's all about you, there is no life there. When it's all about somebody else, then there's real life there. You know, as people left um, 
serving this Friday night. One lady said to me, she said, I feel so good inside. I feel so good inside. And I thought to myself, it's just because you were just serving and you were serving someone else, serving to give to somebody else. That's why. That's why you feel so good. And that's the way you always feel when you're serving someone else. It is a, it's a, it's where it's at. And so the more you, be, you become a disciple of Christ, the more you're going to serve somewhere, someone. That's who you're going to become. You're going to become a servant. The less you are a servant, the less you have died to self. The more self still reigns on your life, on the throne of your life. And so it's, it's really, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens as you surrender, as you yield to him, he's going to take more of you. But he won't take it by force. It's your choice. You see, we battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus has conquered the devil. He's not my responsibility. But the world and my flesh are my responsibility. I need to deal with them and I need to turn away from what they propose and what they exalt as being where real happiness is to be found. So if you, if you really want to see Jesus in your life, you need, to, you need to die to self. You need to ask him to put the old you to death and to live and to come and overflow you with his life. So how does that happen? How does that actually occur? It's very simple. It's a very simple thing. It's not something that's complicated. And, and God knows he doesn't want to make anything complicated. He wants to make it simple. So I'm going to make it as simple as possible this morning. If you want to see Christ in your own life, you have to die. So how do you die while you're still alive? How does that happen? It's a spiritual thing. It happens inside of you. And it, that life comes about by putting those desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, just self itself, putting it to death. And how that takes place is simple. It's by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you this. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. There Paul says, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And notice that last one, self-control. If you want to control self inside of you, the Holy Spirit is the only person who can do that. The only one. You know, when the prophet Samuel came to, to Saul before he made him king, he told him, it's in 1 Samuel 10 if you want to read it, but it's, he came to him and he told him, he said, Saul, he said, this is what's going to happen. And he said, you're going to meet these guys that are prophesying. And he said, the Spirit of God will come upon you. And he said, you will be turned into another man. There it is, right there. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will be turned into another man, another woman. You will become a different person. So has that happened to you? Has that actually occurred? Do you, do you say, I am not the person I used to be. I am so far removed from that person, I have become another person. Has that occurred? I hope so, because that proves that you truly do know him, because he's, he's changed you, and the Spirit of God has come into you. And that's what happens when you believe in the death and the resurrection of Christ. You see, it all begins there. That's where you see him. You put your faith there, and you are then filled with the Holy Spirit. But this must take place every day in your life. You have to be refilled 
with the Holy Spirit every day. In Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus said, If you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The word give there is in the present tense. How much more will He continually give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? That's it. How this happens. Here's another passage. Romans chapter 8 verse 13. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. This is a warning to believers. It's a warning to Christians. He's talking here to Christians. He's saying, don't play around with the flesh. You, you play around with the flesh, you're going to die. He says, so if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, and that's a big if, it's, it's your choice, your responsibility. If by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So notice here, same paradoxical analogy given. You have to die if you want to experience life. It's the same thing. So how, how do you put to death this, this drive that's inside of you for self? For self-glory, self Seeking, self-will, whatever you, wherever you struggle with self, how does this die? You just, when you sense the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you sense any kind of love for the world or exalting of self. You know what you do? You just say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Make this to die inside of me. And when you do that, you're going to experience new life. It's that simple. It's no more difficult than that. Because every single one of us in this room, multiple times a day, you are presented with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And what you do with it will determine everything. It'll determine whether you experience death or whether you experience life. It's that simple. So don't make it more complicated than it is. Just say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make this inside of me that I hate, that I know if I yield to, I will be just like everybody else in this world. Make it to die. And you know what? He'll do it. And as he does it, you will be changed. Now notice what is result will result verse 26 if anyone serves me let him follow me so if you're going to follow Christ then this is how you serve him by fixing your attention on his death and resurrection and allowing him to control and put to death what is hindering you from serving him because again as i said before the more you are a servant, that is clear that you have been changed. This, this, self has been put to death. And the less you serve, the more self reigns upon the throne of your life. It's that simple. So if you're going to follow him, then you have to serve him. And there is no, there's no middle ground there. And he says, for where I am, there my servant will be also. So he's saying, my servants are going to be with me. They followed me and they're going to be with me. So if you say to yourself, oh, I don't, I don't want the Lord to come right now. Uh, there's things I've got to do. There's things I want to do. Uh, I'm telling you, your thinking is, is skewed. It's off. Because... There is nothing in this world that you want, that you think you want, that you think is going to make you happy, that compared to being with him, oh, there's, there's no comparison. No comparison. And then he says here, and if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful. I'm telling you. Him my father will honor? 
What does that mean? Well, unless Jesus said this, I would not say it. But he said it, so it's going to happen. The word honor literally means to give recognition to or to set a price on. And you say, well, I don't understand. Set a price on. Well, he set a price on you when he sent his priceless son to die for you. That's how much he thinks you're worth. Think about that. So he set the price. The highest price that could be paid. And one day, when you see him face to face, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. There is the honor. He's going to honor you before all the other saints. And it'll happen one after another after another. Incredible. But that is what it means to be his disciple and to follow him, to serve him. So I pray this morning that you will you will see how you might see Jesus more clearly and why Jesus turned this whole question around so that he pointed them to how they might really see him in the cross and in the resurrection and how he wants your life to be turned around. Okay? That's what he wants to do. He wants to turn you upside down so that You will not be living for self, not be living for this world, but for living for Him. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You so much that, Lord, You you care about us. You've revealed how much You care about us by sending Your Son. And Lord, I pray that this morning You would just pour out Your Spirit upon each one of us. Lord, wherever we are being tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lord, I pray that you would make that to die inside of us by just filling each one of us by your Holy Spirit. Will you receive his spirit? Will you cry out to his spirit even now and just say, Lord, come fill me, Holy Spirit, now. I need you. I need you to to change me from within. Make me another person. And if you're here this morning and you you don't know Christ or you're not sure if you know Him at all, you can know Him. And I don't want you to leave here without at least an opportunity to respond to Him and receive Him. How do you receive Him? You receive Him by faith. You receive Him by prayer. You, by faith, ask Him to come in and take over your life and forgive you of your sins. That's what He'll do for you. If you want to do that, pray with me right now. Pray in your heart and just say, speak to God and He will hear you. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. Say that to Him. I am a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. Change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to be your disciple. If you just prayed that prayer with me, will you acknowledge by just a simple lifting of your hand here? Yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. Anyone? God bless you. God bless you. Lord, I pray that you would touch these lives. Touch these hearts, God. Lord, you are incredibly gracious. Lord, you forgive all manner of sin. There is nothing you will not forgive. So, Lord, we thank you for your incredible forgiveness in each of our lives. You've changed us. You've made us new. We give you praise this morning. Keep these that have prayed and responded and determine they want to follow you. God, I believe you to touch in Jesus' name. Amen.